Hello, my name is Jota Nasser and I'm a Senior Policy Advisor at the OECD, where I work for the Committee on Financial Markets. Today I'm going to discuss with you decentralized finance or DeFi. So at the OECD we've done a long, a long series of reports on decentralized finance covering crypto assets, stable coins and also DeFi protocols. DeFi is uh, claiming to replicate traditional financial markets in an open, permissionless, decentralized manner without intermediaries. In theory, uh, some of the defining characteristics of DeFi are the fact that it's built on distributed ledger technologies such as the blockchain, and these are public and permissionless blockchains, which means that everyone can send transactions and nobody is actually deciding on who will uh, send uh, the transaction or participate in um, the network. This means that participation also is anonymous, or to be more precise, pseudonymous, and it's one of the biggest red flags uh, on the DeFi uh, space. Uh, DeFi uh, is very much relying on smart contracts. These are code um, that gets triggered automatically based on predefined conditions. And this is one of the reasons why initially uh, the market was concentrated on DeFi protocols built on the Ethereum blockchain, which had the ERC-20 um, yeah, functionalities for smart contracts. Uh, DeFi protocols are, in theory, community-driven, which means that the participants of the network are supposed to decide on anything about the protocol, uh, including through the use of governance token holdings. Um, the nature of DeFi markets is non-custodial, and this is an important uh, characteristic defining these markets, which means that there is no custodian third party intermediary holding the assets. It's actually the users themselves holding uh, their assets. And there is a composable nature uh, on DeFi, which means that one application can be built on top of another one, which also increases the complexity and makes monitoring of these markets for supervisors more difficult. Now, the question is, why did we actually care at the OECD to look into this market as early as 2020, uh, knowing that its size compared to traditional financial markets is really um, small? And there are a number of reasons for that. First, the speed of growth of those markets was exponential, um, particularly after the summer of 2020, which was also named uh, DeFi summer. All this activity is actually happening um, in either a non-compliant manner or um, in, beyond, outside uh, the, the regulatory uh, perimeter, which means that the traditional safeguards that we have for market integrity, consumer and investor protection, and the safeguarding of uh, stability of the markets uh, are not there. Uh, and this is an important uh, reason for policymakers uh, to look into this market. What we also saw at the OECD uh, in our analysis was a trend of institutionalization of crypto and uh, increased participation of professionals uh, such as hedge funds, family offices or other funds in uh, DeFi market activity and the potential uh, risk of future uh, increase in the interconnectedness between DeFi and TradFi. And of course, uh, the, the driver that we identified um, in, in this work in 2020 after the DeFi summer was the increased um, potential for those kind of uh, professional investors to use DeFi protocols to lever up uh, in an unrestricted manner on the basis of crypto assets. And as I mentioned, the, um, the fact that these are uh, protocols uh, to a large extent providing financial services either in a non-compliant or in an unregulated manner, depending on where you sit uh, in terms of jurisdiction, means that uh, there are, uh, there's a long list of risks that we have identified at the OECD related to this kind of activity. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, as these are based on public permissionless uh, DLTs, um, participation is pseudonymous and there are no AML uh, CFT checks or any kind of customer due diligence, which is a huge red flag on its own. 
Um, then, given uh, the, the fact that um, they do not comply uh, with applicable rules or that there is no uh, actual regulation, um, uh, depending again on the jurisdiction, it means that investors and, and financial consumers uh, do not have uh, the, the basic safeguards that we have in traditional finance, such as uh, recourse, um, there is no resolution, um, and uh, any kind of protection for those investors. Knowing also that the level of complexity of these kinds of markets may be actually outright um, unsuitable for the small retail investor. Uh, in recent analysis, uh, what we've seen is that the actually uh, looking backwards, um, this kind of uh, argument and narrative of uh, proponents of DeFi around democratization of finance uh, does not hold. And actually, retail investors um, were the disproportionately hit um, by the, the so-called crypto winter and the failings of the crypto asset firms uh, over the past year or so. We do have governance-related risks because of the lack of accountability and uh, basically the answer to who to call when something goes wrong, which is one of the biggest um, questions as well, again, in theory. Uh, operational risks are similar to other uh, operational risks related to DLT infrastructures, but given the increased uh, use of automation, we have increased um, possibilities for hacks and exploits, and that's what we have also observed over the past few years. Of course, financial stability risks are very well uh, explained in the uh, FSB report, but Financial Stability Board report on decentralized finance. Um, we have uh, increased leverage, we have huge interconnectedness and concentration in these markets, um, and we have liquidity and maturity mismatches. And even though today uh, the interconnectedness between traditional and decentralized finance is limited, this is something that is worth monitoring for the future. Now, I've mentioned many times in theory and theoretically, and this is because today there is global uh, policymaker consensus that the vast majority, if not all, of DeFi protocols are actually decentralized in name only. And this means that they actually have some kind of controlling characteristics, such as a uh, large concentration of governance token holdings, uh, some rents going to someone who has funded the development of the project, someone holding an admin key, or other ways of um, controlling entities having some kind of control over the assets or the protocol itself. Uh, however, in the future, there could be um, uh, challenges related to the fact that DeFi protocols have different market structure and different governance structures. Um, so there is merit in um, analyzing and, and uh, looking into this kind of space uh, for policymakers and supervisors in particular.